Well, hello and welcome to SVO2 Monitoring. My name is David Woodruff. I am the president of Ed for Nurses, where we empower nurses to become extraordinary. In this segment, we're going to talk about SVO2 monitoring, which is oxygen consumption monitoring in your patient. Why we might want to do that, and what some of the different devices are that are available for doing SVO2 monitoring. Now, as this diagram here illustrates, we have many different components involved in the process of getting oxygenated blood to the tissues of the patient's body. Let's start out at the top here under the section that's labeled letter A, and it talks about the arterial vascular system and how we're moving that oxygen to get it to the tissues of the body. So we start out with the arterial system, moving down to the tissue, and then back through the venous system. In the arterial system, we start out with our components of cardiac output. Those are preload, afterload, and contractility. So these are our normal components of hemodynamics that are going to allow us to be able to have good cardiac output for our patient. Those three components go in to the makeup stroke volume. Stroke volume is the volume of fluid that is being pumped out of the heart each time it contracts. So with each contraction, we are getting a stroke volume, and that's what we're seeing in that component. Now over to the left, you also notice that there's heart rate. Heart rate times stroke volume is the equation that makes up cardiac output. So the combination of heart rate and stroke volume makes up cardiac output. So the components then of cardiac output are the heart rate and stroke volume. The components of stroke volume are preload, afterload, and contractility. Moving on down then, under letter B, under the arterial system, we also notice there's some other components involved in oxygen delivery to the tissues. That is the hemoglobin and the SAO2. So the amount of oxygen that is bound to hemoglobin is going to make a difference in how much arterial oxygen is delivered to the tissues, as will the hemoglobin level. Now, so far, we've just gotten to delivering oxygen to the tissues of the body. Notice all of the different components involved. We have the preload, contractility, and afterload, those components of hemodynamics. We have our stroke volume and heart rate, making up cardiac output. And then we have the hemoglobin and the SAO2, making up the rest of our oxygen delivery to the tissues. Now, that's only part of the equation. The other part of the equation is how much oxygen are the tissues themselves using. Now we abbreviate that with VO2. That is the amount of oxygen that the tissues are going to be taking, extracting from our arterial oxygen. Now keep in mind that oxygen, when being used by the tissues, is not going to just come off of there very easily. So the extraction of oxygen by the tissues is kind of more like what happens when people unload from a train. So just imagine a train is pulling up to a station and it stops and it lets people off of the train. Well, if that were the case, then probably everybody could get off of the train. There would be enough time to do that. Now just imagine that same train is coming into the station, but it is not stopping. Instead, it continues right on past the station. How many people are going to be able to get off of that moving train? Well, not as many. Many. And that's the same kind of thing that's happening here with our oxygen extraction by the tissues. Is they're trying to extract oxygen from that hemoglobin that is moving past that cell very rapidly. Now one of the keys that we want to try to figure out here in a patient who is having some difficulty, maybe the patient's not getting enough oxygen to the bloodstream or not getting enough oxygen to the tissues of their body, they have heart failure or COPD or something like that, we want to try to figure out how much oxygen is being delivered versus how much is being consumed so we know if we have a good balance. We can be bringing lots of oxygen but if the need is for twice as much, we still didn't meet the need. So we need to have a good balance here between oxygen supply and oxygen demand. Now we can test how much we're delivering by looking at our SAO2. You put a pulse ox on somebody or you get a blood gas on somebody and you can read the amount of oxygen that's saturated on a hemoglobin. But how much is left over? That we don't have a good way to measure. That's what the SVO2 is all about. So our SVO2 is all about measuring how much oxygen is left over after the tissues extract the oxygen from the blood. Now this diagram here illustrates where we're seeing those different components. So if you look at the diagram up toward the top of the diagram, you're going to notice the DAO2. 
So at the top of our screen over here, you're going to see the DAO2. Now the DAO2 is the amount of oxygen that is in the alveolus. So that's what we're seeing there is the amount of oxygen that's in the alveolus. Now that's kind of hard to directly measure. So instead what we're going to do is come on over to the right hand side of the screen here and we're going to be measuring the SAO2. The SAO2 is the amount of oxygen that's over here in the arterial vasculature. Well, what we really want to know is how much oxygen is being out, used out in the periphery. In other words, out here in the systemic circulation where we have the VO2. That's what we'd really like to know. But we can't just stick like a meat thermometer in somebody's liver and find out how much oxygen it's using. So instead, what we're going to have to do is go over to the left side of the screen, and that is over here to the returning blood that is coming from the systemic circulation, coming back to the patient's heart, and then we're going to measure it in the pulmonary artery. Now, that's a typical SVO2. Typical SVO2 is going to be measured from a pulmonary artery catheter in the pulmonary artery, and it is literally a mixed venous gas, meaning that we have both mixture of the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava coming together when we're measuring the amount of oxygen that's left over. However, a easier way to do this probably would be to use a catheter that comes down into the central circulation but does not go all the way through the heart. We could do that with a triple lumen type catheter what would be sitting in or just above the right atria and that kind of catheter that is currently being used is called a precept catheter. That's what this is showing here. This is a precept catheter. You notice that it looks like a triple lumen catheter in that uh, we have our hub there and it goes down into the catheter itself. We have three lumens that we can infuse medication through and fluids etc but we also have that additional cable coming off that port and that little plastic she uh, sheath here that little plastic uh, adapter that we're going to hook up to a monitor and that's going to allow us to literally be able to take a pulse ox inside the patient's central vasculature so what we're getting is a pulse ox peripherally. You put your pulse ox on the patient's finger. That's reading arterial oxygenation. Then we put this thing in to the patient's central nervous or central venous system. It goes into that superior vena cava, and it's going to be measuring the amount of oxygen that's left over that is going back to the heart. So we measure what we started with, we measure what we end up with, and voila, we can figure out how much we used. So some of the components of our SVO2, and what this is listing here is the SCVO2. That's the one that comes from the precept catheter. The precept catheter is the one that sits in the central venous system. So when we're taking a look at the components there, let's start out on the top left side with the cardiac output. These are a number of things that can affect your SCVO2 or your SVO2. Now, the difference in terminology is SCVO2 is speaking specifically of this precept catheter that sits in the central venous circulation as opposed to SVO2, which is speaking specifically of having the catheter in the pulmonary artery. Yes, there's a difference in placement. There's a difference in where they're reading from. Okay, One of them is reading from out here in the pulmonary artery. The other one is reading from over here in the right atrium or just above the right atrium. So there's a difference in where they're reading from. However, those two values should correlate with each other. They won't be exactly the same, but they should correlate with each other. And again, we're looking for trends. So this is going to be okay. It's okay. We're reading it out of the central circulation rather than out of the pulmonary artery. So what kind of things are going to affect the cardiac output? Well, vasoactive medications, inotropic medications, dysrhythmias, congestive heart failure, and shock all are going to affect cardiac output. If cardiac output goes down, well, then that means this SVO2 is going to change too. Go back to the diagram here again. Remember, cardiac output's at the top of our diagram here before tissue gets extracted from, or oxygen gets extracted from the tissues, or from the blood supply. So that is going to also affect our SCVO2 is going to be cardiac output. Remember too, let's flip back to that previous diagram and you notice hemoglobin is involved in that process. So the amount of hemoglobin will also affect our SCVO2. So hemorrhage, bleeding, anemia, hemodilution, those are all going to affect our hemoglobin level and thus affect the patient's SCVO2. Our oxygen saturation. Okay, so let's back up here again and see, okay, I got across the same line there in our arterial system, we have the SAO2. That is going to affect how much arterial oxygen gets to the tissues and then will in turn affect how much oxygen is available for the tissues to utilize. So hypoxia, suctioning, atelectasis, our ventilation method that we choose to use, our oxygenation and lung disease, all of those things are going to affect the patient's SAO2.
Lastly, the VO2 itself. Remember, VO2 is oxygen consumption. So if our oxygen consumption changes, that's going to change our SVO2 as well. So sepsis, the work of breathing, fever, these are all things that are increasing oxygen consumption. Anxiety, pain, Okay, so we want to decrease your patient's activity level and decrease the fever to try to decrease oxygen consumption. At the same time, we want to optimize the other three components. So when you look at this diagram, one of the best things you can get out of it is the fact that, okay, we've got components here that we need to optimize in different ways. We need to increase cardiac output, increase hemoglobin, increase oxygen saturation, and decrease cardiac oxygen consumption if we're going to be able to balance this ventilation perfusion train. So that's really the key here with SVO2 monitoring. What SVO2 monitoring does is it tells us how much oxygen is left over. SAO2 is very important because that tells us how much we started with. Moving that oxygen to the tissues by way of the the cardiac output and the hemoglobin is very important. And lastly, we want to decrease our oxygen consumption so that we can make a good balance. This monitoring is important for us as nurses because the number one thing that's going to change your oxygen consumption is going to be nursing interventions. Remember things like pain, anxiety, activity, those things are increasing oxygen consumption. And the reason why nurses need this information is because it helps us, first of all, to find problems early before the patient starts to crash. And secondly, because all of our interventions could potentially increase oxygen consumption, which would then lead to the patient possibly not getting enough oxygen to feed the tissues of the body. Thank you for joining me for SVO2 Monitoring. My name is David Woodruff. Come join me online at edfornurses.com, where we empower nurses to become extraordinary.